Okay, all of you should have received a chart. And um, this chart is a, a picture of things that you should have seen and, and remembered from our first night together. And I'm just reviewing quickly some things so that tonight's presentation will be very timely in your mind. Do you remember the illustration I used the other night about the, I drew a timeline um, and I was talking about the siege in 605 BC where Daniel was taken into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon, you know, uh, Israel had gone into apostasy and God sent Nebuchadnezzar to take Israel and so that the Jerusalem and the land would be vacated. Well, do you remember I was talking about the people living up in the years prior to? And finally the time came for God's judgments. And the people who are living at this time had no idea of what was about to take place. They had no concept of what God was about to do because they weren't listening to God. And as it was in the days of Noah, they had no idea, Jesus says, that, it was, that the time had come for the rain to fall. But if you go to Genesis 6, you'll find that God established the timing at the very beginning. He said it will be 120 years, and then the rain will fall. But when the 120 years were expired, lo and behold, nobody knew it. <laughs> How do you explain that? Well, I'll give you an example. The 6,000 years are about to expire, and no one knows it. Same deal. Same, history repeats itself because we never learn from history. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Okay, so this little chart shows you, up here at the very top, the grand week. Now, there are two weeks described on this chart. And up here, you see, it's called the Grand Week. And over here, down here, you see the Great Week. There are two different weeks. And what's different about these two weeks is that this Grand Week is made up of 7,000 years. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So we have Sunday as a thousand years, Monday as a thousand years, and so forth. Okay? Everyone sees, sees that. All right. Now, let's look at the great week for a moment. See this little week down here? In this calendar, each day of the week represents 490 years, which happens to be 70 weeks. Right here. See that 70 weeks? And so each day of the week represents 70 weeks. And so we have a total of 3,430 years in the great week. This is the Jubilee calendar. Now, I, I'll, I'll talk a little more about the Jubilee calendar tomorrow, but what I'm trying to show you is that God has the weekly cycle, seven days. Then he had a weekly cycle of seven years. And then he had the jubilee cycle of seven weeks of seven years. And he keeps building up, and he has several calendars all built upon the weekly cycle. So the end result is that we have a calendar which shows us and reveals to us God's timing. And he did this from the beginning, because he knew from the beginning where the end would be. Okay. So when we look at the chart, down here in the lower left corner, we tracked from Adam down to the flood. And then we went over and we tracked from the flood down to the Exodus. 940, 31 years 
when it was properly adjusted for inclusive counting. So when we look at the calendar, we see Noah's flood is here, Abraham is born here, Jacob is born there, here's the Exodus, here's where Jesus came to earth and died in the middle of the 70th week. And then we see the Jubilee cycles ending in 1994, and here we are, we're living just before the seventh and Sabbath millennium is about to begin, when earth will get its rest. We're living in this little area right here. Making a mess of the screen, aren't I? Right there. There's where we are. And you'll notice I have the word delay written here. And this delay indicates that we are living at the time when God's angels are holding back the four winds of his wrath. Um... We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I just want you to see, for right now, this delay is where we are living. And we've been in this delay since 1994, as I understand it. Now, let me show you the Bible text so that you can understand what I'm talking about on the, on the delay. John saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, preventing any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or on any tree. And these angels are told, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then John says, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Now, last night, we talked a little bit about God's four deadly judgments. What were they? Do you remember? Famine, plague, sword, wild beasts. And where did, we, where did we learn about those four judgments of God? Where did we start last night? I bored you to tears while we read the chapter Leviticus 26. Remember? That's where the covenant began. And this is where God laid out his four judgments against Israel. And then we find that um, in Ezekiel, the Lord sent his four judgments against Jerusalem. What were they? Sword, famine, wild beasts, and plague. And what were their purposes? To kill its men and their animals. And why does God kill people? We've been studying that this week. What's the, what's the reason? Wickedness. Wickedness. Very good. Very good. Well, I want you to understand that these are the four winds. Four dreadful judgments. And these four angels have been poised to release God's four dreadful judgments on the earth since 1994. And you've been driving down the road, listening to the radio, totally oblivious to this. Haven't you? You have no idea. We know, because of the chronological nature of apocalyptic prophecy, we know that the fourth seal is the next one to be opened up. And when the fourth seal is opened up, when the Lamb opened the fourth seal on the book of life, he, John saw a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. There they are. This is the next. Let's scratch this out. 
I don't know, I don't know what day this will actually take place. I don't know what year it will actually take place. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing that in the, this is 2014. Let's guess in 2018 that God's angels, four angels, who are standing at the four corners of the earth, are going to release the four winds, and God's judgments are going to befall earth. I'm guessing. It could be tomorrow afternoon. It could be any time. Jesus said, at an hour when you think not, the Son of Man comes. Now, when Jesus talks about his appearing and his return, he's not talking about a punctiliar event that happens on one day. No, he's talking about a parade of events where he appears at the end of the parade. The coming of Jesus consists of a parade of 14 events. Seven first plagues, seven last plagues, 14 events in all. Okay. Let me see how well your instant recall is working. When God's patience with wickedness is reached, what does he do? Sends destruction. And we have some examples. Noah's flood. The destruction of Egypt, the destruction of Babylon, the destruction of Israel. The other night I gave you 12 examples, just easy examples. God's patience with wickedness is finite. It is limited. And when he sees that extended mercy has no redeeming effect, what does God do? Springs into action and destroys so that the oncoming generation will have a chance without the burden of sin imposed by the previous generations. What are his four dreadful judgments? We've just discussed that. Sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. And I read to you from Ezekiel 14:21. God calls these four, my four dreadful judgments. And what does he do with them? He kills men and animals. Okay, here's a thought question. Yes or no? You have to answer this. God is justified in the eyes of the holy angels when he destroys a wicked generation for the benefit of oncoming generations. Yes. Yes, yes. God is justified. A God of love is justified. Notice here, I'm going to jump forward. Here, here we are today, and let's suppose here are the seven first plagues, and let's suppose here are the seven last plagues, and let's suppose here is the second coming. Jesus appears at the end of these 14 events. And I'm jumping on this text down to the third bowl, which occurs right here. Okay, Revelation 16, 4, we're at the third bowl. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. This means the wicked will be drinking blood. There will be no water for the wicked to drink. It will all be blood. Verse 5, then I heard the angel in charge of the waters... The angel who had just done this turned everything to blood. He says to God, you are just in these judgments. You are justified in what you're doing. You who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged. Verse 6, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. And you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. During the
the seven first plagues, a time is going to occur where Babylon and the devil's forces are going to kill a third of mankind. Now, I'm not talking about God killing a fourth of mankind. I told you, it would get worse tonight before it gets better. <laughs> What I'm saying to you is that the population of earth, by the time Jesus gets here, is going to be less than 50% of what it now is. Let me explain. Let's suppose there are 7 billion people on earth today. The number is actually a little larger, but let's just use this one. If God takes out a fourth... One-fourth of seven is 1.75 billion people that God kills, that God destroys with the first four trumpets, the first four judgments, the first four of the seven plagues, first plagues. When we get to the sixth, bowl, the sixth trumpet and the fifth seal, just Ignore those numbers for a moment. They don't mean anything to you. The devil is going to be permitted to kill a third of mankind. You can read that in Revelation 9. I'm not making this up. And here's what's interesting. Let's take 7. Let's subtract 1.75. And that leaves 5.25 billion survivors. Let's take now a third of 5.25, and wouldn't you know it, it happens to be 1.75. God kills 1.75, Lucifer kills 1.75, and that means the population of earth is going to be less than 50% of what it now is at the second coming. May I read a couple of verses just to show you? Here in Revelation 9, this is when the sixth trumpet, this is when the sixth angel who had the sixth trumpet sounds his trumpet, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of mankind. We're talking about right here. This is the sixth trumpet. This is the first four trumpets. So we get a third of mankind killed here, and we get, whoops, when the fourth seal is opened up, The rider on the horse is named Death, and the grave, Hades, is following close behind him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill with God's four deadly judgments, sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So here's a fourth, here's a third of the surviving, which is, happens to be the same numbers. And when you add them together, you get three and a half, which means, counting for other attrition, less than 50% of the population of earth today will be alive when Jesus returns. Rather sobering thought. You don't hear this, do you, in church? You don't hear pastors talking about this, do you? It's a shame. The reason that I'm talking about it, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm not trying to alarm you, not at all. I'm trying to tell you what God is about to do. And so by ha having you understand why he does what he does, you will not be afraid. You will not, be, uh, uh, you will not abandon your faith in God. Your confidence that you will believe when you see. 
Because you know it was predicted in His Word, and when you see it, you will... You won't be blown away. Just the contrary. You will know God is doing exactly what He said He was going to do. I read it with my own eyes. I see it in His Word. If I perish, I perish. But that's okay. We'll talk about that too in just a little bit. All right. The reason that I'm, what I'm trying to say is that when this third bowl is poured out on the wicked, this is during the seven last plagues. These people who are going to be forced to drink blood, why are they forced into drinking blood? What does the Bible say? Let's go back to Revelation. The angel says, for they shed the blood of your saints and prophets. The people who are the recipients of this bowl are murderers. And so God says, they want blood? I'll give them blood. Here, all you can drink. And the angel says, you are just in these judgments. And you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. They were bloodthirsty. They killed the saints and the prophets during this time period right here. This is sixth trumpet. This is seventh trumpet right here. Right here during this period of about 221 days, 222 days as I understand it, about seven months. A third of the earth is killed by these murderers. And God gives them blood to drink. All right. Last night we talked about Leviticus 26. God and Israel entered into a bilateral, a two-sided covenant. And God promised many, many blessings. And he also promised many, many curses. And after 700 years of dealing with a wayward and rebellious Israel, Ezekiel 5 tells us, that God killed two-thirds of his own people and sent the rest to Babylon for 70 years. I'll show you the verse. Ezekiel 5.9. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, through Ezekiel, to his people. And God says, because of all your detestable idols, I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. Therefore, in your midst, fathers will eat their children and children will eat their fathers. What does that mean? Famine? The, the way in ancient times cities were destroyed is that here's a city and the soldiers would come and set up a siege around the city and starve them out. And in order to survive and in order to keep alive they would eat and the bodies of the dead who died from malnutrition. And the promise, remember famine is one of the four judgments. Right? So, God is saying, Therefore, in your midst, fathers will eat their children, and children will eat their fathers. I will inflict punishment on you, and will scatter all your survivors to the winds. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary, my temple, with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will withdraw my favor 
I will not look on you or with pity or spare you. Here's the, here's the, the death sentence. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine. What are these two judgments? Plague and famine. That's two of the four, right? It, so a third of your people will die of the plague or perish by the famine inside you. That is inside the city of Jerusalem. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. There's the third judgment. And a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. So God destroys two-thirds and scatters the remaining third. Then my anger will cease, and my wrath against them will subside, and I will be avenged. And when I have spent my wrath upon them, they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal. Now, I have a thought question. Yes or no? Israel's response to God's covenant determined Israel's future. <laughs> yes or no? The reason that you need to think this question through, you need to understand that your response to God's covenant will determine your future as well. You see, God's dealing with Israel is but a mirror of how he deals with all, of, all nations. This is just a mirror. He chose one to show the rest of how he deals with all of us. Does God watch over us to see what our behavior might be? Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Why did Israel have to spend exactly 70 years in Babylon? Who, who has the answer for that? Anyone remember? It, they, it, they, Israel, between the time of King Saul, remember I drew this on the chart last night, Israel, between the time of King Saul and King Zedekiah, violated 70 Sabbath years. And how long is this period of time? 430 years. And in 430 years, there are exactly 70 Sabbath years. So the reason the Babylonian captivity has to be this long is because God made a promise. And what was the promise in Leviticus 26? Notice verse 27. If in spite of this, that is milder punishment, you still do not listen to me but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger I will be hostile toward you. And I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. Notice. Now this is 700 years before it happened. I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years. All the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the time that it lies desolate, the land will have the rest. It did not have during the Sabbaths you lived in it. Second Chronicles 36.16 says, But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. Notice what God did. He brought against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the temple 
in the sanctuary, and spared neither young man nor young woman, old man or aged. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, God used Nebuchadnezzar as the destroyer, as a destroyer with the sword to put to death two-thirds of his own people. And then the scripture says, Nebuchadnezzar carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God and all the treasures of the king and his officials. And then they set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value. And he carried into exile a remnant who escaped from the sword. And they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. So, Second Chronicles 36 tells us the promise is fulfilled, which God made 770 years earlier. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in the fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. You have to take God seriously. God means what he says, and he says what he means. And this is a problem with the carnal nature. This is a problem with the sinful nature. People don't believe that God means what he says. And this is why in Noah's day, nobody entered the ark. God's patience with our sinful ways always produces the following outcome. See if you can understand the slippery slope a little better. In indifference and carelessness about sin in one generation is the seedbed for arrogance and blasphemy from the next generation. True or false? And this becomes, the second generation's arrogance and blasphemy, becomes the seedbed for hatred and total rebellion against anything God has said by the time we get to the third generation. You understand the slippery slope. You see how civilizations start off so well and fall so low. You remember the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. How does the third and fourth generation come to a point of hating God? How, do they, how did they get there? Because of the slippery slope that we just discussed, that we just examined. But God goes on to say, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Last night I made this comment, every person has a prophetic mindset and we can tell what a person really thinks about the future by the way he lives today. I don't want you to forget that. I rarely say anything profound. That was supposed to have been funny, but I don't, I don't think it worked. <laughs> In Noah's day, most everyone believed life would go on without interruption. Most everyone thought Noah was a kook. Most everyone believed tomorrow would be the same as today. And most everyone was wrong. It's no different today. And those in error discovered their fatal mistake seven days after the door of the ark was closed. Falling rain ruined a million prophetic paradigms 
within five minutes. Big oops. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all, Jesus said. And it will be just like this on the day the parade begins of the 14 events that the Son of Man will be revealed. It will happen without warning. Think about this. If God had wanted to save everybody in Noah's day, he would have left the door of the ark open after it began to rain. Right? And what result would this have produced? Everyone would be running into the ark to save himself. Right? Of course God knew this, and herein lies the problem. Without faith in God, it is impossible to please God. God chose to save only the faithful, only those who believed. And that amounted to eight people. I've heard estimates that the civilization that lived before the flood numbered somewhere between 100 and 500,000 people. I don't know what the reality of that would be, but I do know that no matter how many people there were, eight is a small number. If God had wanted to save the whole world, he could have just left the door open. And today, what you hear from Christianity at large is that God is anxious to save everyone. Yes, he is, but on his terms and conditions. God isn't interested in saving us on our terms and conditions. We have to meet his terms and conditions. And that's why without faith in God, Hebrews 11.6 tells us, it's impossible to please him. Do you have faith in God and his word? Do you really believe what he says? Does your faith affect your behavior? The book of Daniel has been unsealed. The time of the end is here, and you need to know and can know what God's plans are all about. And I've attempted to show in simple terms the fairness and love of God, that he's not willing that anyone should perish, as well as the wrath of God against wickedness. That is, he's not willing for oncoming generations to suffer from the degeneracy and decadence of previous generations. So, we have to understand that God deals with humanity on two levels, and after we take a short break, we will look at these two levels to understand the difference when God is dealing with a nation, or a world, or an individual. Keeping the two levels separate is very important in understanding God's policies and God's ways. Let's take a break. There's water here. The restrooms are there. And we'll resume in about 10 minutes. <laughs>